Right, so it's your virtual machines. So, really, this is if you're familiar with hosting, and Mike's obviously done a great job of just explaining this, but if you've had a data center before, any hosting agreement, you're probably familiar with this kind of technology. So it really is providing you a virtual machine, be it Windows, Linux, um, because for Oracle, SQL databases, that kind of stuff, that you can stand up in a data center quite quickly, remote into, manage, you look after it. So really what we're talking about is having someone else look after the hassle of the cabling, all that kind of stuff that you really don't want to get involved in every day, keeping your data center cool, powering it, managing the infrastructure beneath it, managing the virtualization layer. But why worry about that when Microsoft can do it for you? These guys can run VMs, they can probably do it better than anybody else, they can probably do it better than I can, um, and they can use the projectors as well, as Mike demonstrated. Uh, so I'm gonna jump on now, and I'm just gonna show you something, just because I felt I should do a demo, and I've only got 15 minutes. I'm gonna provision a VM. I'm gonna stand up a Windows Server through the portal, Windows Server 2012. I won't be brave enough to do an SQL database on it as well, so I know it doesn't quite finish in 15 minutes, having tried it a few times. Um, so I'm gonna just jump out now, sign into the your management portal, and stand up a VM with Windows Server 2012 on it. Now one of the cool things in, in that is that the license for Windows Server 2012, any client access licenses I need to connect to that are included in the cost of me running that VM per, per minute. So I don't have to then worry about piling some extra license into licenses stuff because I'm paying for that in the cost that I'm paying for with the, the VM hourly cost. Likewise, if I put SQL on it and use one of the templates with SQL in, the SQL license is included in that runtime cost as well. So I'm now gonna jump out and show my ineptitude with a projector. So here I am, I'm signed in, I'm in the demo account here, you can see it's not much signed up and I'm signed in there as my, with my Hotmail address, but I've just got some stuff I've been messing around demonstrating to customers here. So in the time it takes me to do these slides, I'm gonna try and provision myself a VM. And I'm doing it through a management portal. A lot of this stuff I can script as well. So if I've got bulk prepare a load of machines, or if I've got my own image, I can my, load my own image into Azure and I can spin up a VM based on that image. So if I've really got an OS image I've developed, it's got my AV in it maybe, and it's got some other management interfaces, I can do that. So I'll just pick on, these are the images available to me. So you can see down there, if I want to build an SQL server, I've got some images in here. And obviously you need to configure this SQL server afterwards to work with your app and work with your database, but you haven't had to do the install to set up. So I'm just gonna literally now go away and pick a Windows server. My screen doesn't scroll very well, so down the bottom there, there'll be a tick box somewhere. <laughs> the danger of using somebody else's laptop here. <laughs> oh, there it is. There we go. So I now get to choose some version release dates. So I can choose, so Microsoft do update these base images. So if it's a major service pack or update, it gets put in and you can see the version release date. Now, if you've spun up a load of other VMs from a specific release date, you want to make sure you go back to the old one, keep the same one. Let's call it pull C test. Again, I can now choose some basic sizing of my VM, um, so I can choose how much, how many cores, how much memory it gets, etc. I'm going to do a user, give myself a username and a password, all of which I'll forget the time it provisions. Now there's some stuff here, I can create cloud services and I can set my network up, I can configure this to join my virtual network. I'm not gonna go through each of these with you now. Again, we are gonna to plan to run another Azure session. If you are interested in that, I think on the feedback forms, you can put a tick in a box somewhere, or we can sit down and we can go through some of what these things mean like cloud services and affinity groups, and we can help you understand those. We may provision some apps and, and show you how that works. But. For now, I'm just gonna, I've got a demo service when I go out and speak to people about this, so I'm just gonna use that. And I've got a virtual network I've created. Now this is a network that allows me connectivity back to my data center. So when I spin this VM up, I'm gonna have network connectivity back into my data center. And I have a storage account, uh, some demo storage. Not worry about availability sets, find out a little tick. I can expose some services to this box, so if I want to be able to HTTP to it, run a web app on it, FTP, whatever. Um, for now, I'm going to leave that as blank. 
and that is going to go away and you'll see there that it's provisioning itself and that will be provisioned by the time I finish my demo um, I mean I'll use Stuart's machine to try and connect to it which will be a challenge in itself and I'll probably have to get my phone and show me how to use Windows <laughs> so moving back to the presentation Okay, so we're now hopefully spinning the VM up in the background. You'll see that, it will work. So Mike's explained this to you already, but really, when we're talking about the traditional data center, we're talking about you look after your hardware layer, your virtualization, then the OS, the network, that kind of stuff. But with Azure, someone will look after that hardware and that virtualization layer for you. So you don't have to worry about configuring Hyper-V clusters and failover of VMs and moving stuff across your storage area network quick enough and cables and switches and all that good stuff that you may enjoy playing with, but it can be a hassle day to day. When you spin up an Azure VM, you still manage the OS, that's yours, you do what you like with it. You still have to put your AV apps on it. You still have an admin sign into it, still in your domain if you choose it to be. You still look after the firewall rules and control your access to that box. And you put, look after the data on it and the applications, you still have to make sure if you need to retain that data, it's backed up in some way. It's perhaps outside of an Azure service if you've got real concerns about data availability or retention. Um, so you're not losing control of that server by moving it into Azure. You're, no, you're not giving anything away. You're just having a big benefit of not having to play around with cables and switches and SANs and disk failures and things like that. That's not your problem anymore, which gives you time to make the service that runs on that server better, serve your end users better. So where where you might want to think about virtual machine scenarios. Mike's slide, I have to say, was much better than mine. <laughs> He's obviously a PowerPoint expert, I'm not. Um, but really, production deployments, when you're seeing that server go end of life now, why spend time buying a new machine, sticking it in your data center, putting the disks in it, configuring it, getting your image on it, finding out that the, the rate card's different now, and you need some different drivers, your image doesn't work. Why don't you provision that server or think about provisioning that server up in the Azure cloud and moving the app up there that it serves with it? Um, we've seen a big uptake with disaster recovery, SharePoint farms, think about that kind of stuff as any use for Azure and maybe save yourself the investment in technology and resource that you're just chucking into a data center. So another one of the development and tests is a great environment for Azure. Now, when we say development and test, automatically I think, hey, there's a load of app developers that are sat in a dark room somewhere hammering on keys making apps that I use and generally don't understand how they code it. But I go out and I demo stuff. I used to go out in a pre-sales role a long time ago and demo a help desk application to people. And I took out a laptop, and I took out a USB disk, and I plugged it into my laptop, I fired up VMware Workstation, I spent about eight minutes waiting for it to load, then the server didn't load properly, so I rebooted it again. And I was carrying around all this kit to demo as an application to a customer, which I would then tear down afterwards, bring back to the office. I'd have to come sometimes fix it before I took it out again. Well, with Azure, as an IT pro, I can stand up that test environment in Azure. I can go out and demo it like I am today by RDPing onto that machine, demoing the application, just as I would have done carrying around this bulky laptop. But at the end of the day, I shut those VMs down. I don't pay for them while they're shut down. I might not go out and demo the application again for another three months. I'll spin the VMs up before I go. Off I go, do my demo, and then um, spin them down again. It's a very good, cost-effective way of being able to demonstrate that kind of stuff for an IT pro, not just the guy who's developing the apps, he needs some servers spun up to code on, um, but it's useful for that too. Um, rapid development and execution, well, here's a great one for you. I mean, I don't know if you guys get it, I've worked in some organisations before where suddenly someone in marketing's come up with this great fancy new app that they want to run on some servers and they go, well, you just need to build me an SQL server. And, oh, by the way, it's got these storage requirements. And I'm flipping through an eight page manual thinking, how am I going to do this? Um, with my infrastructure, and I have to go through a whole heap of procurement to get that disk, to get the space, I need to get it to the data center, all that kind of stuff. Well, I can rapidly spin up some VMs in Azure for them. I can get SQL on from a template. I can go and, go and give it to the third party that's putting the application on for HR and my bit's done for the trial, they might then turn around and say, yeah, this app's great, we're gonna deploy it system-wide, I may then think a little bit more about how I wanna do that. But I've given them a server, a storage space, for a very limited cost. The application might turn out to not meet their needs and I can tear that server down, stop paying for it, and it's cost me no upfront investment in technology, which is a great thing. So where are we seeing our customers use, uh, where are we helping our customers now, where are we seeing them use this year? 
So we've been here today predominantly talking about Office 365, right? Now I don't know how many of you have used 365, how many of you are on it now, how many of you are looking at it, and how many of you have thought about single sign-on across your 365 environment. But to enable single sign-on in 365, it needs servers, right? It needs some servers on-premise, typically. I mean, typical model, it needs servers on-premise. And they need to be asked to, to speak to your DCs. If those servers go offline, it doesn't matter where you are, but you can't sign into Office 365. So if you set up single sign-on and you bring those true, true single sign-on, you bring those servers on-premise, you want to make sure they're available, right? Because when they're not, your users can't sign in. And that's a big deal. So we're seeing people use, uh, move their AFS up into for single sign-on for Office 365 into it. So there's a tiny slide down here that's kind of just shows you the domain controller on premise and everything else is running in the cloud. Um, so you've got that 99.99% .99 availability for your Active Directory single sign-on. Now, if you're achieving that kind of availability with a single data center, then, well, come tell me how you're doing it because uh, that'd be very interesting. Um, extending corporate AD into the cloud. At the moment, really, you're not going to want to move all your DCs up into Azure, and I don't think Microsoft would support you if you did, but you can move one of your DCs or a couple of DCs up there. Now, there's two reasons why you might want to do that. One, is natural DR, so if something happens to your data center, happens to your office, you've got a domain controller there. But also, you might be starting to push some applications up into Azure. And a lot of those may rely on your AD. And you don't really want these applications authenticating back across a WAN to your local domain controllers. So having a domain controller in Azure is a great, great help there. And uh, I will say that it is AWS, Amazon Web Services. Um, we have seen a few customers migrate back from Amazon Web Services. Now that's not to say they're necessarily happy with what, unhappy with what Amazon Web Services have provided, but if you're using System Center, Hyper-V Manager, that kind of thing, you can manage your on-prem and your cloud servers from the same management console. As Mike pointed out, you could have a server that you need to every now and again really massively scale up, but that's only once or twice a year. So you can migrate that VM real time up into Azure, keep it spinning, run it there, and bring it back again. So if you're looking at managing through System Center, that's what you can't do with Amazon Web Services. To move your servers back from Amazon Web Services, for example, to an on-premise, you've got to convert the disk, you've got to take the server down, you're going to convert it, you've got to copy it across your network, and you've got to stand it up again in the right format. That's a hassle, right? Microsoft really does enable a true hybrid management and cloud experience for you. Backup and DR environments, we might touch on that. I mean, there's many things you can do with backup and, and DR in Azure because it's out of your data center. And one of the key ones we see is people using DFS, putting a DFS replica up in Azure. Um, they've got them somewhere where they've got a copy of all their files. It's real time, they make a change to something on prem, it replicates up to Azure, and they're using that as a way of keeping some files outside of their network. And there's things where services come and talk to us about having a whole Hyper-V recovery manager environment where your Hyper-V machines that run on-prem have a replica that's up in the cloud, maybe 15 minutes lag behind that can just be spun up if you have a DR environment. And of course, pr production workloads, many, many uses, say so production web apps, production database apps, on-premise on applications you've written yourself that use IIS, SQL, any of that stuff's a great target for Azure. Um, what I've seen recently, I've only seen one customer have talked to me about it so far, and that's to have a cloud-based system center distribution point. So if anybody who's familiar with system center to push out OS deployments, they may have a distribution point in an office, perhaps in the US, where they need to build a number of workstations. But well, why not truly put that up in the cloud and be able to push out network speeds, depending, obviously, your OSs and your applications to any location? So we said that model where people were thinking, well, I've got 50 people in an office over there, I better put a distribution point there. Or stick it up in the cloud, as long as they've all got good network links, you can push out and OS to those guys regardless of where they are. And really exciting, I'll be honest, I've not had much chance to do much with it yet, unfortunately. I'm busy with all the other stuff, but Zero AD um, for single sign-on across software as a service applications is something we're really excited about at Soltech. And you can see that really, uh, really help us. I know I get users phone me up and say, oh, I've forgotten my password for application X and I don't have access to it and I can't sign in and then we have to go through some written role of getting the account back and manageable so it's a great thing as well. Right, so how we can help? Well, it's kind of limitless really but we can help you identify what's a good workload to migrate, what isn't. There are some still things that still perhaps but don't work as you expect them to when you get them up to us yet. So we can help you spin up a trial, get this stuff up into the cloud, test it, 
maybe tweak it, perhaps help scale it so that something you couldn't do on premise you can now do in the cloud. So to look and help you really understand where Azure can improve your current offerings to your users and to, to, your, um, to your network. We can help with price and sizing guidance. Um, so it's not complicated, <laughs> it's a page you use model, there's some sliders and stuff on the web. We do have access to a full spreadsheet that can help you work out exactly how much it's going to cost you depending on the storage options you select, that kind of thing. So we can work with you on there. With zero virtual networks, um, again, probably saying for more of a deep dive to really understand, but think side to side VPN really. Um, so we can help you configure side to side VPNs between pretty much any device in the Azure cloud. And there are some limitations around that. Um, I'm hoping they're going to be changed shortly. Um, we won't get into that too much at the moment, but essentially you can hook up your data center and multiple clients can have VPN clients on as well and they can VPN directly into the Azure cloud. Um, so we can migrate, oh, this one there, VM provisioning automation. Well, you've just seen me provision a VM, hopefully, um, and we can connect to that, but that was a very, very basic way of doing it. I went through a management portal, I typed some stuff in manually. Well, you could script that, so you can use PowerShell to spin these to provision the VMs how you want them. That may include in streaming in your antivirus, that kind of stuff. We can help you with that. that stuff. We migrate existing servers. We can move pretty much anything to anything um, with near zero downtime. So we've got some tool sets we take, uh, we use in certain scenarios, but we can keep your users and applications online during a migration and then perform a final cut over. So you've got a very small amount of downtime out of the cut over. You've done out of hours to reduce user impact, um, that kind of stuff. So. Pretty much any app you've got, if we can get it running on the Zero VM, there's no reason it shouldn't run. And um, again, we try and encourage people to take use of their trials and help them through their trial periods to test and retest and, and retest and make sure you're 100% happy. Um, and we can do that with leaving your server on line, working with all your customers and then just trickle feeding the replica of data out. So you might think, well, I've got this server on premise and it's got one, know, 10 terabytes of storage, I'm never going to get that up to the cloud, it's going to take forever, I couldn't take it down for long enough to turn it into a VHD and copy it up. Well, we've got some tool sets that will do incremental copying. Um, we can seed data through a very complicated process of shipping disks around the globe, but you could seed data if you needed to, and then bring that image online and start making <coughs> the changes. So there's nothing that should be a barrier that should stop you thinking, I couldn't get that into the Azure Cloud, is really the message there. Um, and once you've got that VM up there, well, it's still, you know, Microsoft are looking after the cables for you, they're looking after the data centre, and they've got the virtualization layer covered, so you don't have to worry about restarting your Hyper-V services or updating your Hyper-V hosts when the new Windows updates come out, anything like that. That's all done with, but you still need to support and manage those Windows servers, just as you would if they were Windows servers running in your data centre now. We can help there, um, as we would do in a traditional physical environment or what any one of our customers with a virtual environment as well. So that's just a standard support service. That kind of concludes my slides. I'm going to go back and see if this VM's provision. I'll probably have to drag Stuart to show me where his RDP client is. Um, but let's give it a go and we'll see what happens. Okay, so that button. See, I actually use a Mac. I know I shouldn't say that at Microsoft, but this Windows thing's really confusing me today. <laughs> uh, function F4, duplicate. So, yes, there we go. So, I've successfully created that virtual machine. Right, so it's only got Windows in it, it's nothing massively exciting. Um, I wasn't brave enough to try an SQL one just because it took 18 minutes last time. I thought it's bound to take longer today. Um, but I've got an option down here. I can connect to that VM now, and that's going to download or give me an RDP file. That RDP file I can open up with the client. Where do your downloads go? Let's have a look. There we go. So I can now RDP into that as if it were in my data center or sat in my broom cupboard or wherever. It's going to ask me for a account. Okay, I now have a Windows Server 2012 server running pretty much as if I'd provisioned it in my own data center. 
which is far enough, I'll just log in for the first time, obviously, so I can create my Windows profile. Now, I could join this into my domain. I happen to have <coughs> Azure Virtual Network set up back into my data center, so I've got domain controllers in this instance in that data center that will be contactable, and I will be able to join that into the domain just as if I would if I built it in my data center or, or my existing virtual environment, wherever. And I can illustrate that kind of I won't want to bother joining it into the domain because someone will shoot me back in the office for not having a change control or something in place before I do. Um, but I can ping. I know, for example, in my data center there's a DC, sold DCO2. I don't think that's giving away any too much trade secrets. Um, and I can ping that, and you'll notice I get an internal network range back from it. So that's a 192.168.0 network. That's in my data center. I've got a Windows server. And, and that really concludes my demo um, and my slides, conveniently enough. Um, so has anyone got any questions? I know I've rushed through that, so I think I have 15 minutes. Um, so, yeah, I think I've, I've just about done it. <laughs> any questions? In terms of the connectivity back to the yeah. data centre, um, do, does Azure have any of the kind of direct connect, um, non-tunnelled, connectivity to certain data centers or backbone not, providers? Not that I'm aware of. I can go away and take that offline and try and find out for it. I don't think so. So basically I provision a virtual network through the portal. Yeah. I can do it two, one, two ways. I can do a site to site. So if I've got a Cisco or a Dell Sonic or whatever, I can figure a site to site VPN that's tunneled out across the internet to that, to that network. Um, and I can have a client that I can pull down onto clients. So I can enable just this laptop if I wanted to, to speak to the easier cloud. And so when I was talking about doing that development stuff, rather than necessarily going for a site to site, I just have a client endpoint on here and I connect up to the Azure cloud. Um, so the answer is I don't know, I don't think so today. But there are, I believe, going to be some changes announced around the network and stuff in shortly. <laughs> but I don't, I'm not privy to exactly what they'll be, but that may have something to do with what you're talking about. <laughs>